You're listening to Gradient Descent, a show about making machine learning work in the real world. And I'm your host, Lucas Bewald. Today I'm talking with Jake Heller, CEO and co-founder of Case Text, one of the most innovative tech companies in the legal space. It's also one of the very first companies to make a really working real world application of GPT. And last year it sold the Thomson Reuters for $650 million. Jake really gets into the weeds on how he made GPT work for his use case. And I think anyone around GPT or LLMs will find this episode particularly useful. I hope you enjoy it. All right. Well, this might be a cliche place to start, but I need to do it because I know this is a good story. Can can you start by telling us the story of case text from from what you were thinking at the beginning to the um, the large acquisition? Where it ended, yeah, totally. So, it's, first of all, it's a long history. Uh, Take your time. We, we were, yeah. <laughs> well, we were in business for ten years before our acquisition, and so to, to kind of jump to the end, it's it's one of those classic, uh, you know, quote unquote, ten year overnight success stories that you, you you hear about in Silicon Valley sometimes, where you have to work for ten years to make something that um, really really works. So we, we began. Uh, I was a lawyer, um, and so were my co-founders. And I think we all share the feeling that uh, as where with, uh, you know, 10 years ago and, and still is true today, when you're using the consumer technology, regular, regular technology, if you wanted to find something really easily or, you know, have use a, a very kind of simple interface, um, you could do that very simply and, and, and quickly and easily with tools like Google or your iPhone or whatever. But as soon as you step into your law office and you needed to find a piece of evidence that might, you know, exonerate your client. You know, get them out of jail, or enable you to win a, a billion-dollar lawsuit on behalf of a client, which may make the difference between the business existing or not, and other such things. Uh, it might take you many days to find a piece of information, and uh, you know, or or you may be struggling against the technology. And so we thought, well, if we just bring consumer-level, um, you know, natural language processing and user interfaces to law, uh, we would, you know enable this, this kind of non-trivial, really important for a lot of people kind of use cases for, for lawyers. And so that was the idea behind the company. And we know we're known now as an AI company that actually wasn't the original vision. The original vision was really around crowdsourcing and enabling uh, attorneys to help build a really good source of information and build a great kind of search UI on top of that. Um, long story short, attorneys didn't want to contribute their time and information the same way that Wikipedia editors or GitHub contributors or Stack Overflow question answers were, were just a very different personality. But we, we, you know, we found that out kind of the same time that um, natural language processing and kind of very early versions of artificial intelligence, nothing that even resembles what we have today. But we saw that that potentially providing major value to our customers, even without the crowdsourcing of information. And, and so we leaned more and more heavily into that. And we started working with, you know, large language models, basically since the BERT paper in, what was that, 2017, 2018. Uh, and really early on that bandwagon, we saw immediately its applications to make search better in our case. And I think in part because we were so deeply invested in that technology, um, we were really tracking closely the work at the major labs, including OpenAI, we had a pretty good relationship with. And so, so fast forward from the kind of founding to closer to the end, we, we got really early access to GPT-4 um, and immediately saw an opportunity to go way beyond anything we were developing for our customers at the time, which is more of like a search-based tool. And uh, we saw this opportunity to instead create, using this technology, the world's first AI legal assistant, uh, an assistant where you as a lawyer could just ask to do um, you know, major legal tasks like doing research for you or reviewing thousands of documents or uh, editing contracts in similar kinds of activities and um, at almost unlimited quantity, you know, research dozens of questions, review thousands of documents and get answers both at a human level of quality, you know, rivaling that of like a first, second or third year associate at a law firm, but at superhuman speeds. And so that that product, that new product direction, and uh, new capabilities, really, I think, launched us towards the end of our of Case Texas, like kind of 
history as an independent company, um, culminating in in uh, an acquisition by Thomson Reuters for six hundred fifty million dollars in cash, which took place you know a little less than a year ago. But I guess GPT four, even if you had early access, it happened you know maybe nine or ten years into the company. So yeah, you know for example, like um, you know twenty seventeen when you're starting to look at these um, you know these early large language models, what was the product doing and, and how were the models helping then? So the, the main challenge that we're trying to solve for our customers is searching for information. And the real focus of our product at the time was helping them find, you know, do a task called legal research, where we had um, over a billion pages of legal information updating daily, uh, cases, rules, regulations, and statutes. And you know, finding the right, say, precedent to help make your your point in court was really, really important job for lawyers. And so we were helping search and find the right information. The same thing is true of uh, people would upload their own databases of information. So you're doing an internal investigation as a lawyer for a company, and you're trying to figure out uh, whether or not fraud had committed or insider trading has been committed. And you're looking over all the emails and Teams messages and so on. And so they'd upload you know, sometimes millions of documents to a database. Um, you know, many of them are like ESPN fantasy news alerts or whatever. Like it's just so much stuff that, that is irrelevant. And there's oftentimes it's a needle and a haystack kind of challenge. And so that those are the that was the big challenge we're solving for customers at the time. And the I way see, that so yeah. You're probably using like embeddings, like you're trying to find like kind of semantic search. Yeah, yeah exactly. Exactly. The way that this this ended up being really important is semantic search was um a really, really good fit for uh, for legal in particular, because you know sometimes, for example, I said you're looking for a precedent. Judges just write these like legal opinions that become precedent, become like the law, basically. But they use this you know pretty diverse set of language to describe the exact same things. So keyword based searching, which is what most of our competitors offered at the time, would miss really critical uh, uh, legal you know legal opinions and precedents. And sometimes it bubble to the top stuff that is like very obviously irrelevant. You know, the same words used in a different context mean totally different things. But embedding like the sentence or paragraph level or both, um, you know, it's, it's kind of commonplace now, you know, honestly, in, uh, in, in most tech stacks for, you know, not just in legal, but across, you know, basically every vertical at this point. But at the time, it was like really novel and gave us a real edge over, um, you know, why use us instead of others. Uh -huh. And I guess bef before we get like super deep into the the technology, b before this company, you were working with the Innocent Innocence Project, weren't you? I mean, you, you kind of come from an interesting legal background. And in, in fact, did, did that do you think that influenced um, this this product in any way? Yeah, I mean, I, I I you know, if you look at my LinkedIn, for example, I, I would look just kind of like a normal lawyer before starting this company. Um, and so I think there there are a lot of personal influences on on how the company and product evolved. Like I grew up out here in Silicon Valley and I've been coding since I was a kid. So on the one hand, I, I really fell in love with technology. On the other hand, I fell in love for a variety of reasons with, with law and policy and justice and had worked on, um, before starting case decks, I worked um, at nonprofits for the government, um, you know, including uh, just very short stints like an intern basically for the White House Counsel's Office and for the governor of Massachusetts at the time. Um, and I, uh, you know, really saw, I guess, firsthand through a lot of those experiences that without great technology, if you have more money and resources to throw at a legal problem, the odds of you doing, like succeeding, um, go up substantially, even if you're not on the side of, of the right answer or justice. And I always, I think, I think a lot of lawyers practicing see that and they have kind of a pit in their stomach about it. Um, and so we saw from day one, the opportunity for technology to be a, a equalizer to, to level the playing field and kind of fast forward, you know, we're back into uh, case tax days. Like when, you know, we had, we had a relationship with the innocence project. I'd informally done some work for them, but that was renewed again when we launched co-counsel. And it turns out that they have these like immense problems um, where even just getting your case reviewed, you know, if you're in the innocence project, the way it works is um, people in jail will say, hey, actually, I'm, I'm innocent of this crime. And I think we can prove it's like DNA evidence, like something that's like hard, you know. Uh, and a lot of these folks have been in, in jail since before there was like 
good DNA testing used in trials, but the evidence has been preserved. So, um, so they apply and say, Hey, I think that, you know, my murder or rape or whatever case is like, it's, it's not on me. It's on somebody else. And I've been in jail for like 20 or 30 years at this point. Um, and the innocence project will review that case, but just the reviewing process. They had a, 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 the California Innocence project had a three or four year backlog of files to review thousands of for each, each case. It's like thousands of pages of releases reports and, you know, witness testimony and statements and so on. And they, they like to review these things and decide which cases they dig deeper into a four year backlog on that and feeding that into like AI, for example, um, you know, when, instead of the two folks running the show and like the, the four interns, or whatever they had at the office, right. Spend it up by, by, by years to help make them make determinations on which cases to take or not. Um, so, you know, it was really edifying to see, although it took a very long time to get there, some of the causes I cared about and worked on even before starting case techs were the kinds of things where um, the technology we were building could really make an impact. Uh, and now my, my impression of your company is that it was kind of, you know, really kind of struggling or not working for a long time and then sort of started to like really work as the technology ad advanced. Is that like an accurate understanding? Like, was there one moment where it, it was like, Hey, like now the technology like works so well that it's really like powerful for, for customers. And, and if so, like what point was that? Or, or am I misinformed that it's just sort of this, this kind of gradual um, increasing of capability that eventually kind of, you know, got to this point where, um, it was working super well, or maybe it's just like kind of GPT hype. Like what, how, how what, what do you think? I would uh, say, I would say it's similar to the first two things that you said, which is we, we, you know, we're doing pretty well. Um, we entered 2023 before launching our co-counsel product to the public. We had already been developing it for a number of months and, and had it in beta with a number of customers, but we entered it in a pretty strong position. We were growing fine as a company. You know, we had a good product, maybe even 10,000 customers at that point. Um, wow. So it's not like we were, um, you know, on the ropes or whatever. There was never the, you know, you, you hear about some of these companies, uh, maybe including uh, some that you've run, where they have these like massive takeoffs and, and they're, you know, raising these enormous rounds and they're got being constantly reported on, um, you know, in the news and, and TechCrunch and so on. That was not us, right? We were kind of under the, like behind the scenes, slowly growing, getting better gradually. And then um, for us, GPT-4 is a moment where uh, the value that we could provide to our customers kind of exploded overnight. And we could take some of the pre-existing assets, like all the billions of pages of legal contact, content we've developed, great search technology, 10,000 customers. And you add on top of that, you know, an, an incredible increase of, uh, of capability and utility. Like all of a sudden, this, this AI assistant does a lot more just searching. It reads for you, it edits, it does all this amazing stuff. You add that on to a thing that's already, you know, kind of working pretty well. And uh, and that's where you hit like what felt like a real inflection point for us. So we've been growing call like 50 to 70% year over year for the years before then. And then in the first like few months of 2023, we almost doubled or tripled our revenue. This is crazy, you know. Um, and that's just the numerically that's one way to put it, but like also it just felt very different being at the company. Like you could feel the velocity um, and feel the impact and and and, you know, there's this great essay by Mark Andreessen that I think about a lot these days. And it's people, people credit it as like the first time the word product market fit was like coined. I think it's, I think the essay is called something like the only thing that matters or something like that. Yeah. I know exactly um, what you're talking about. Yeah. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. So there's a paragraph yeah. in it and he's like, talks about what product market fit feels like. And uh, he says stuff like, well, your servers will go down because so many people will be using it at the same time. You'll have to, you can't hire support and salespeople fast enough. You, are going to be hounded by the press. Um, they're going to be staking out in front of your of your house, you know, just to get an interview with you. They're going to be you can eat your eat for a year free of bucks. Is one of the things he says. The bucks is like this woodside, you know, cafe or or diner out here um, that that you know a lot of VCs live near, so they want to have you meet there. And then none of that was happening before, you know, co council and before that product that we launched. And literally all of that happened after co council, almost like verbatim. It was kind of freaky and. And so we had thought we had product market fit before, and we had some some amount of product market fit. We had a lot of happy customers, um, but nothing felt quite like that essay. Like you know, then I like literally had to buy the press servers going down, couldn't hire sales and support people fast enough. 
uh, and I ate a lot of books, you know, <laughs> and, and for every other free risk fundraise, for example, we, we would always get like one or two term sheets if we were lucky after like months of, uh, and then we're getting term sheets thrown at us, you know, in this, and, and that, so that must've been GPT hype. It also is like a reality of, of, you know, people be doing these like market maps and, and, and trying to figure out what's going on in legal tech. And everyone's saying like, you got to check out case tax. And that was the first time it's ever happened to us. We had investors coming to our door, you know, um, yeah. And, and, and that, that was like a very, very different, you know, night and day kind of experience for us, for sure. It's funny. I feel like some cynical people watching this, you know, might, might view that as kind of like a, like a hype story. I mean, certainly like, you know, well, first of all, 50 to 70% growth is fantastic from my perspective. So I don't want anyone to think that, that I consider that, you know, not good. Um, but, you know, I, I guess, you know, VC, interest in in meeting and um you know growth is probably connected but not always the same and i feel like it disconnects the most um in the ai realm so i mean I, but it sounds like the from your perspective the product was just really like palpably different and and more yeah. powerful and and were you using um like gpt3 also and it was like the switch to four that really was the change or yeah i mean it just, you know I, I, it, so, so first of all, I do think there's the, that, at least in our case, the the increase in value is incredibly real and palpable to our customers. I'm uh, going from like a basic a search tool to this um, uh, AI assistant you can ask and do basically anything. It does it like really, really well and really fast. And it expanded us, I mean, like very tangibly into parts of the workflow that we just weren't even touching. You know, for those kind of lawyers or those no lawyers listening, you know, you go from just legal research to reviewing documents, reviewing contracts, um, reviewing contracts for compliance with the playbook, for example, uh, or, or a set of policies of the company, um, you know, searching over vast databases of, of information and summarizing those results in a little paragraph, all that stuff is like, you know, like five or six X more valuable than we're, we're offering before. Um, and, and so I do think, you know, it, I think that, that the indicators that are matter more, much more than VC interest, because I agree that, you know, not always the same thing as as what's happening in reality. Sometimes it's, but you know, kind of loosely related to reality. Um, it's just the increase in, in revenue and retention and usage, and uh, in you know, people are just publicly saying about us, you know, everywhere. Uh, and, and so it, it was very like I say this is humility because we know what it's like to not have that for like nine and a half years, and so to experience all that from your customers um, over you know the last kind of six to nine months of our company before before exiting, and that. You know, still building the product, still hear about this kind of constantly. It was it was definitely a step change in in value. And I think the other thing too, by the way, in terms of the hype thing that is is not investor related, but I think is an interesting learning for for me. In our industry, and I think this is true of many industries, we are fighting an uphill battle to get them to even care about AI before GPT four, and really before ChatGPT. Um, and what ChatGPT did is it created this moment where all of a sudden everybody was talking about AI. Within law firms, they're like, oh, this is going to replace us potentially. I don't really know how or why or what, or maybe not replace us, but this is going to change the way I practice. Again, I'm not sure exactly how or why or when, but I got to know about this. I got to keep informed about this. And, and so for the first time in our history, instead of saying like, we're going to make you more efficient and that's scaring lawyers because they bill by the hour and, you know, it's a pretty bad story. Like, hey, we're going to make you more efficient with negative ROI, but you, you ought to do it because it's good for your customers. Um you know, all of a sudden they're like, well, we, we acknowledge the world is changing because of AI and it's going to change in really substantial ways. And so I better be on top of it. And we went, you know, from having conversations from still like important people with our law firms, like chief knowledge officers, chief information officers to like the managing partner of the firm. The person is basically the CEO of the law firm who needed to, to meet with us personally to really understand how this is going to impact their business. So to the extent there was like a hype moment around ChatGPT starting in November, 2022, that really like played into, I'd say, our, our growth in that we went from kind of a kind of trying to push our way into being pulled into these deals. Um, and that was a really, really big change. And that, that that's persisted. In fact, it's accelerated in legal. Um, as I think more and more applications have come on board and, and the utilities more and more proven out. And and if I were to give any advice to other founders, if you find that moment, you know, don't try don't try to push against what customers want or are looking for, even if you're right, you know. Even if you can prove that you're right, they really ought to be doing this. Um, try to find the moments where they're really pulling, like they're really looking for the solution right now. Um, the, the difference in, in how how 
difficult it is to sell and how um, you know how much coverage you're going to get in the local trade press all the way up to the national press. Everything will, will, will depend upon what the zeitgeist is and what where people are pulling from. You know, the answer question about GPT three and so on. Um, we we had a relationship with OpenAI, and it's it's funny to remember like OpenAI before ChatGPT. It was obviously an impressive organization. They had, they had some of the most impressive people working on this. Um, but I think that like they were not commonly, you know, they were not a household name. Let's put it that way. And tools like like GBD3 were, um, you know, had some real utility, like especially in the marketing copies. A few companies took off with GBD3 with that. But definitely not in like other fields like legal. And and so our relationship with them to some degree was they would come to us and say, hey, does this work for you? Let me show you a snapshot of a model or show you. And we're like, no, this is, this is not good. Like we cannot use this. It is hallucinating wildly. You know, it's it's coherent sounding English, but it's not really useful for our purposes. And then when we got access to GPT-4, um, we tried some of the same stuff we've been trying for years, kind of assuming... We didn't even know it was GPT-4, by the way. They, they just said it was a new version of GPT-3 or something like that. They were pretty coy. So I think they called it DaVinci-3 internally or something like that. So it was like, you know, just like the next, and there's already DaVinci-2. It's like as if it was the next version of, of DaVinci, right? Um, which is kind of what we assumed. So we could try to play with it and we're like, okay, whatever. Until it started just nailing everything we're giving it. You know, I mean, very popularly, we, we were the ones who ran the bar exam on it for the first time, an unpublished, yet, yet unpublished bar exam. So we knew it wasn't part of the training data. And it, it like did better than at least like seventy to ninety percent of of human test takers, you know. So we're like, okay, this is super different, and and there could be something interesting here. And I think it took us like a weekend of not sleeping, and just constantly just working with this thing, to to be like, okay, there's something real here, and, and they this is a turning point for its utility and legal. Um, yeah, it's still not perfect, as everybody knows. It's not a perfect model. Uh, you have to do a lot of work sometimes to mitigate some of the dumb things it does, or to you know, you only build certain capabilities based around its its, its current limitations, but the, what it could offer was such utility that we we knew we had to lean in. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, you know, I think something that people might not appreciate, but I do, is the the challenge you might have. You know, nine years in to kind of hop on the trend like that. Like, I, I think like, you know, you would have a lot of advantage of like existing customers. Um, but I, I could imagine, you know, most organizations would have a little bit of inertia to, you know, kind of maybe like the way that things are, that they were doing things and, and the change from, you know, running your own models to using um, uh, third party models is, is a big one, right? Because it, it, you know, can, in some cases, you know, make a lot of work irrelevant and, and, you know, people's jobs irrelevant. And we watch, you know, I, our customers um, wrestle with the, these changes all the time, often, you know, not very well, but it seems like you did a really great job of really leaping on a, a different way to accomplish the the goals that you had. I mean, wh what do you account for that, um, that ability to navigate that change? You know, it's funny is, is that, um, so, so it was a really big change. Um, I remember, getting up in front of, we then like, we had a hundred employees and be like, everybody, we're stopping what we're doing. Um, and we're all going to work on this. And by the way, we don't even know when this is launching publicly and therefore we can launch it publicly. So on the one hand, like clock starts now, we may have just three months and we got to build something great before then. Uh, we may have six months, in which case we did no nothing public for six months. And that's when they would look weird to our customers, but it doesn't matter. We're doing this right now. And, and so um, I think that so on the one hand, like, yeah, it was like a very, like, in retrospect, correct move. And in retrospect, it was actually probably more difficult than I felt at the time. At the time, I was like, this is the most obvious thing I've ever seen in my life. And in some ways, I'm surprised that more companies haven't done this, kind of in our space and others. Totally. Where you get handed this, like, absolutely breathtakingly new and different technology um, that, you know, your customers have been begging you for years, if you only could do this, I would totally buy your product. They're like, well, that's impossible. That's, that's insane. You know, there's no way we could possibly, we have to develop a custom model just to do this one tiny part of whatever that doesn't make any sense. And now all of a sudden this one model handled all those education and did everything the customers were asking for. And so for, so to, to me, my co-founders who were the first ones to kind of have access to it, we're like, this is a slam dunk obvious move, you know? Um, but you know, it, it actually was kind of controversial within the company for exactly the reasons you said in, in ways that we, in some ways at first kind of somewhat underestimated. And there was some change management that needed to happen. 
people were skeptical. People were like, oh, here we go again. Some new other tech, tech you know, uh, kind of craze. Like, I think here's what ended up making it successful inside our organization was a few things. The first is that we talked about the executives first. And all the executives after like an offsite that we did were like, okay, yeah, this is, this is, this is awesome. We should obviously do this. The second thing is we made it very tangible. Like I personally built the first demo of co-counsel and we demoed it in front of the whole company and then gave everybody access and let them play around with it. And they could see exactly how legal research was going to work and exactly how reviewing documents would work. And it worked pretty darn well. It wasn't as good as what we eventually released, but um, having that kind of something very tangible to get people excited about, I think went really far. Um, the third thing that really helped was that we talked to customers pretty early. We brought a few in under NDA um, with a very early beta. And for our sales and success and support people seeing our customers react in the way that they did, um, I think really made a huge impact. And then finally, like culture as a company make a huge difference. And we actually specifically look for people who are flexible. It's like one of our, not a company value, but we had these like traits and characteristics of folks that we'd like to hire. One of them was about flexibility. And we look for people who are, you know, kind of this kind of great startup mentality of like, okay, I was doing that yesterday. That's it is what it was. Um, and, and, you know, th that comes in handy in a lot of different ways. Like th this big change was, a, you know, obviously one of the biggest, maybe not the biggest kind of, I wouldn't call it a pivot per se, but like biggest new product approach you've taken or whatever you want to call it. Um, but we also, you know, we shut down all of our offices during COVID. And, uh, you know, there are times where we thought we we're going to raise around and we didn't, we had to kind of change our approach to fi finance. And all this other stuff just happens in startups. Like it's, it's a volatile, crazy kind of world, as you know, running a company. And we looked for, we looked for people um, who not only could handle it, but did really well through those kind of transitions. And so having that group of people there already kind of pre-selected for that, who had gone through some stuff together already, um, you know, uh, I, I think really made a big difference there too. I, the kind of right people in the room to, you know, and, and being frankly small enough, just hundred people, uh, all that I think made an impact. So the culture of the company was in, in a place receptive to that as well. But I, I can't emphasize this enough. If people listening here in your, in our industry are similar ones, I can't believe more people have not done this. If you're in like a vertical and you're servicing with some like standard SaaS application, you have the opportunity to create like an AI coworker for your clients now. Like the value has gone up from being just, I make your workflow slightly more efficient to, I will do part of your work or your, your colleagues' work for you. And we know what the value is that people get paid to do this work is. It's like their salaries. I'm not saying that we're going to replace a bunch of people's salaries. It's, it's, you know, for other reasons, kind of in the opposite. But, you know, the, typically pay a lot more for just like one person they usually pay or like five people that you pay for most software. So if you can get that kind of value out of software, sell it to your clients and scale that, it's like huge. And I, I can't believe more people haven't thought about that a little bit more, you know, and kind of some people have added an AI this kind of sort of light way, or, you know, it's kind of on top of the product a little bit um, to make their, their workflow applications a little more efficient. But if you're like servicing like the insurance industry or doctors or the other aspects of legal work or whatever, like there's so many opportunities, like millions of opportunities to be like, oh, well, what part of your job? you know, can we do with AI um, faster, better, cheaper, and enable you to do more important stuff? And how much do you value that at? And I think that's that's where um, that's where the big opportunity is. Well, totally. I mean, you know, I think that's an incredible message to send to people and people should listen. I also wanted to have you on this podcast because I think you kind of underestimate the skill that you have in navigating that change because I think it, it comes easily to you. But clearly is is difficult um, for a lot of people. And certainly there's like an inertia step, but my feeling is that there's other things that you were doing to actually make this a good product. Like, for example, you talk about, you know, making a demo over a weekend. And I think a lot of people have that same story of making an exciting, you know, demo over a weekend, but then kind of have trouble, even after getting a company excited about moving in that direction, have trouble getting that into a product that's that's really useful for a customer. So yeah. maybe you could talk a little bit about what the journey was like there, because I think that's where a lot of the people listening to this show get stuck. Yeah. Yeah. And I actually think to that point, the, the kind of weird place you are with technology is it's truly really easy to build a really fantastic demo. And and then after that, building a great product is like super hard, super hard with this technology. 
And I could talk about what we did, and not to say it's like a formula for everybody else, but there might be some analogies. Um, first things first, it was really helpful within our company that that we had so many domain experts. Um, you know, from the top to the bottom, a lot of folks had practiced law, um, really knew it deeply. And so when it came time to design like the user interface and the um, the the prompts to, you know, what, what does a good look like? Uh, and I'm happy to go through this a little bit more in detail. Like, what does it look like to create like, a great prompt or even get great set of prompts to achieve the the kind of end result? Um, we were already kind of a step ahead there, I'd say. Like, we're not perfect, but like we started from a place where um, we intuitively knew what we think our customers would want and intuitively knew how to achieve it using this new technology, how we'd express the, the you know, the, the objectives to be done in English. And we're starting from there. And I think that that a certain type of company right now is going to be really an advantage, which is going to be those like deeply, you know, if you're, if you're making these like AI coworkers, um, then being, having been one yourself, whether you're the founder or have the right product people around you, great desires around you, that kind of experience, I think is going to put you in like the first, first good step. The second step that, um, I think is really important is around testing. Like, ironically, I was never like a, a formal engineer. I was always kind of built stuff for fun. I never really got into test driven development in that world, right? Um, but I'd say the opposite for field folks who are not driven by test driven development in the pre AI world. I think it's the opposite now. I think you need to almost write your tests first. What is what is like success look like? And in AI, you know, for these kinds of like generative AI or, or large language model applications, we're doing things like review a thousand documents and tell me which of the which of them have any evidence of fraud um, or what have you. And then you can create these like test sets that look exactly like that, right? X number of documents, X number of questions. Here's the right answer. We objectively know it for whatever reason. Um, go and see how well it measures up. And we would literally put together hundreds and then letter thousands of tests against each of what we call our, our the skills that CoCouncil has. If we review documents, then it needs to be able to review. You know, here's an example in Japanese, and here's what the answer is. You know, it's going to review this and ask the site to this page where the answer is located. Or this this paragraph where the answer is located. Um, you know, if it's going to be you know a contract, it's going to have to understand that the definition in page one and the the clause in page seventy two have to be used together to create a kind of a novel and weird meaning of it, but has to get that weird meaning. And you so you set up these like test criteria, and, and there are ways to do this. Um, with like if the answer includes this word or includes this number, then it's like fine. If it doesn't, it doesn't. Right. So the kind of basic tests. But also to use AI to grade kind of more conceptually difficult tests where the words may not all exactly be there. Um, so you set up these tests. Um, we built our own framework, but now there are many frameworks that are being sold as kind of like this kind of AI gold rush. Um, many of them are very good. Uh, and and that's what we built first. And then the prompters and product developers, what we call skill developers, would, would work against those tests. And what, what ends up usually being the case, you know, the third kind of thing to think about here is when you're actually building these like, capabilities or skills for the AI, um, they often mirror almost exactly what the best person in the world who's doing that job would do if they just had an infinite amount of time, basically. So like we did legal research with co-counsel and you know, the way it would work is customer would ask a question. Behind the scenes, it would take that question and, and maybe have a back and forth conversation to make sure it really understands. After it understands, so that's like one set of prompts, right? Understanding, the, uh, getting a firm understanding of the of the query. Second set of prompts is taking that one query and turning it to like twenty different search search questions or queries, right? Um, you, if you're a great legal researcher, you don't just try one search and call it a day. You try different keywords, different approaches to to researching your question, different um, different search engines, different databases. So we have prompts that basically made the AI do that. And then a list of results come back. You do some like do duping or whatever behind the scenes. And then we gave every result to the to GPT-4 to review um, and make a quicker determination, re relevant, not relevant. If it was relevant, it would start making like notes basically that it start compiling of its understanding of the answer based on the things that are found that were relevant. And then finally a set of prompts that would take together all of the notes it would make um, and turn that into a memo responding to uh, the user's original query. All those steps vastly resemble the kind of stuff that I would be doing if I was a researcher. I would hear the question from the partner, try 20 different searches, get hundreds of results, review each of them. Some of them I'd quickly be able to say no to. Many of them I'd say, okay, there's something interesting here. Let me underline this part, pull out these quotes, take these notes, right? 
And then I compile that into an answer based on the notes, et cetera, I compiled. That, that's what I would do if I had an infinite time as a legal researcher. And so, um, so in that, you know, I, I described like a half dozen prompts or so to get to, and other kind of technical processes, hitting a search engine, the duplication of, of results, et cetera. Some of it's kind of boring, but needs to be done. Um, each of those needs to be tested as well, because each of those may be the area where everything falls apart. So, uh, you know, you could have, uh, uh, a a result, you know, fall apart because step three or whatever in the in the chain of the processes um, just does not get the right answer. So between like having the right people in the room to make the right decisions, having a very extensive testing, and then developing skills with the mind frame of like, what are all, like, can I break down into steps all the things that an insurance adjuster or support professional or a lawyer or paralegal or whatever would do in this circumstance, whatever, whoever you're building for, um, and then test each of those steps very rigorously. I think you're in a pretty good starting position, I would say. I think, um, well, first of all, this is exactly what we tell our customers to do. So yep. um, I'm totally aligned with with the rigorous evaluation and and starting with the evaluations and kind of making that. Um, I think design, designing the evaluation is the most important part of making these things um, work. So totally, totally agree there. But, you know, I'm I'm thinking about why you know, people don't um, build these evaluation systems very well. And I think one place where people get stuck is it's actually hard to do the evaluation automatically. And especially when you're generating things, you know, you really want like a person to look at it, but it's probably not feasible for a person to look at and grade every time your system runs. So maybe you can get a little specific. And in your case, it sounds like you really are generating text here you need to automatically evaluate if that's the text you want. Certainly it's not going to be the exact same string every time. So how did, how yeah. did you make that work? So, so there's two, two approaches here, or maybe three that are worth noting. First is to the extent possible, especially for these like micro steps along the way, make the, make the out, output like numeric or objective or something like that. Like here's like a, a tip that I'm surprised more people don't adopt. Um, the, uh, Say it's making a decision about relevance, right? It's a generative AI model, so we all think like, oh, I should like write a whole like essay about whether this is relevant or not. But actually, like, I think people just put too much, you know, emphasis on the generative and not enough emphasis on the intelligence. It's actually a very intelligent model. So if you, for example, be like number one through five, five being the most relevant, one being not relevant at all, how relevant do you think it is? That's going to compare very favorably to previous AI models. It'll be a little slower, but if you're looking for like raw intelligence, you know, GPT four to be like five. That's probably going to be a very relevant thing. And you can do little tricks, like you can have it output the number first and then provide its reasoning second. You don't get all the benefits of chain of thought prompting, but you do get, um, it, we, we've seen, we think, our hypothesis is it thinks ahead about what it has to write for its reasoning and therefore does a better job of throwing out the number. Either way, we've seen an increase in performance. I'm not sure why. And you use stop words to break off its reasoning. So it adds or, 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 or you know, total to total max tokens. So it, it thinks it's about to write you a whole essay about why this is the most relevant document ever, but you cut it off after the first token produced. So that's a very objectively testable. Is this, should this have been graded a five? If yes, pass. If no, we got to change our prompt for this, this test, right? Um, for the things that's not objective, yeah, you, you have to do kind of like AI evaluation um, for scaled stuff. But we also had like um, a lot of our customer support and success people, maybe 20 or so professionals constantly checking these tests, like at least once a week, if not in the very early days, once a day, they'd be going over and hand grading some of this stuff as well. As well in the early days before we figured out AI evaluation that well, we, we, we would just took, you know, and, and kudos to them. They were, they were supporting our customers and be customer success people by day and like kind of like Batman or whatever, like would turn on at night and like check these tests. It was a lot of work. Um, to to make happen, but I would encourage folks to consider like, is there an ROI um, to including uh, some people who are you know good domain experts in our case are success people almost entirely if not if not entirely former attorneys with deep domain expertise in their in their particular fields they can apply to the tests they created the tests and also get a grade in the tests um, like maybe reallocate some people there you know it's it's a, it's a really good use of resources if you can get a trustworthy accurate product. And I think we have the, the biggest thing, by the way, is in terms of the people we were talking about earlier, the challenges that people have in terms of going from a like cool demo to actually is like, 
we just had this confidence based on the intelligence of the model that with enough prompting and work and guardrails and breaking down the steps, that you can actually get products that are, are very, very, very accurate a very high number of times uh, and only fail on like the kind of things that frankly, young attorneys would also fail on, not like just kind of randomly or just from the state wildly or whatever. There's a lot to be gained through prompting, a lot to be gained through um, working against a good test set, a lot to be gained by decomposing tasks into smaller pieces when necessary. Um, a lot to be gained by just trying a number of different approaches, like the, the try just having an output a number or a word, a single word, like true or false or what have you, depending on the task. And, and um, what what we found through our experience, and I, I doubt it's any different in any other field, I think it'll be the same in most other fields, is if you put in a ton of effort to those kinds of activities, you'll come out the other end with like a thing that you can with reasonably say, yeah, this is operating at a level that, that if it was a person, I would hire this person. It's not really that perfect, but like, yeah, I mean, like, you know, it's, and maybe when GPT-5 comes out, it will be perfect. Who knows? Like, who knows what happens this next kind of term technology? But but the technology today has a 10-year roadmap of stuff we can build against it because it is good enough to basically be like, yeah, I'd hire, I'd hire this guy if it were a person. So I should be willing to onboard this technology to, to support me. How much of your improvement do you think came from, um, like tweaking the prompts versus decomposing the steps in the right way versus maybe other things you haven't talked about, which I would love for you to to mention, like, I don't know, for example, fine tuning or, or other techniques. Well, the, the fine tuning stuff, um, and this is just us, this is not, I think, universally true. We have not found there to be a ton of value to fine tuning for our models. Um, and to be specific, we were doing a lot of experimentation with smaller models. I think it's a huge benefit. If you get a small model working for you, it's local, it is fast, it is cheap. Um, and and uh, I think that that the, the frontier is going to be these open source small models. Don't get me wrong. We just haven't been able to make it successful for our use cases yet. Um, we've been using a, a not fine-tuned copy of uh, GPT-4 for the vast majority of the tasks that we do. And so... Um, again, I'm actually a big believer, kind of ironically, even though we're not using it right now, a big believer in the direction of that. We've seen some very promising stuff kind of in the lab, so to speak. And I think that's, that'll be coming in the coming months and years from us and from, from many, many others that have already brought them into production. Just for whatever reason, like we haven't seen, you know, uh, say a Llama 70B outperform GPT-4 in a task, get close, but not outperform GPT-4 in a task, even if it's particularly fine-tuned trained for, um, for that particular task for us. Right. Um, so for us, that that isn't as big of uh, a component as I know it is for other businesses. And, I, and again, I'm very optimistic about where that's going. I would say that maybe equal weight to, to better prompting and um, and decomposing the tasks. I would say that like um, you'd be shocked about if you were willing to like you know, have, a, have an interface almost where you have all your tasks in one hand in the screen and your prompt in the other hand in the screen. And you tweak your you tweak your problem. You see it's failing in three use cases or ten use cases or whatever. Do all those share something in common? Add an instruction. Passes those. Get a beta version. Get it in the customer's hands. And they're like, hey, it failed this other edge case. Add the test set. You know, tweak your prompt to make sure it covers that. You can get so far with that process alone. Like a really, really far. Or just like seeing where is it failing? Is it failing consistently? And like any good test set, you change one thing over here, and then something breaks something over there. So you have to kind of accommodate for that. Like all that happens. But, um, you know, the, I, I say the main characteristic right now, and this, this will probably change for GPT-5 and 6 and Gemini 2 or whatever, but the models aren't perfect yet. So you need a lot of handholding and explanation and, and kind of sometimes frustrating, you know, working against this like kind of models, you know, post-training or whatever to get it to really do what you want it to do. Uh, but you can't get there through prompting. And, and the number of qualifier I have for some of my prompters is, are they willing to stay up all night for four nights in a row to um, just make it work? Because you, you you will find that the people who were able to kind of grind through and, and test, 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 change the problem, test, 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 after a certain time, like, oh my God, a thousand of a thousand tests are, are passing. Like, that's crazy. You know, uh, and once a thousand are passing, um, you can feel pretty darn good about the next hundred thousand, you know, and pretty good even about the next million. There's there's some amount of like, you know, it, trans, like even though it'll be hitting new experiences, new documents, new questions, new whatever, um, it's going to do pretty well. Like if you're if you're at that kind of level of testing, so I'd say I'd say that's a prompting gets you really far, farther than than I think is is discussed or acknowledged. Because I think most people just aren't willing to put into like 
five sleepless nights, like, you know, grinding their way through, uh, prompting it. But once you get there, it's, it's, you've, it's really amazing. Like what, you know, how, how specific and good you can get your models to be. And so this is like, not this, this is really looking at like specific examples where the model's failing and trying to modify the prompt. So it fixes those examples. And then it's kind of looking at what's regressing. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And, and, and like use the simplified example again of like, is this case relevant to this question? Um, you know, on a scale of say one to five or whatever, there, there's kind of an objective answer there. You could debate between a three or four, maybe, you know? So, yeah. and sometimes, sometimes you have to, when you're developing these prompts, give the model some like, oh, okay, that's an error from my grade set, but like, we'll let it slide. You know, it's like fine. Like a human could totally do the same thing. It's a reason reasonable expectation. Um, but like, uh, uh, you know, we, we've, you know, basically seen that like, yeah, you can get it to say five, but it should be a five and four should be four and one, which should be a one. Um, and again, having the model up in its reasoning, even if you don't use it in, in, in practice, then it's very helpful to you can cut it off after a certain number of stop words or, um, uh, you know, stop words or, or max tokens or what have you, um, ends up being really helpful, uh, you know, just to see like why it thinks that this thing that's obviously not correct is correct. And then you kind of, you know, it, it's not exactly like this because these models are not, you know, they're not brains like, like we have, but oftentimes it will say something that's actually kind of reasonable sounding. You're like, oh, I see where it got the mistake. Let me add that to the prompt. And then all of a sudden it's fixed. So a lot of it is like trying to find as, as close to an objective ground truth as you can as to what, you know, if, if, if the application developing warrants it, um, build an objective ground truth and then, um, and build against that basically. And now, is it the same process for hallucinations? I mean, this is one of the problems that we have with an internal bot, you know, that we made. I think you can iterate on the prompt um, to kind of fix fix the errors, but the hallucinations have felt a little bit different and and tougher, um, at least for us to remove. Did did you find any different strategies worked for you there? Yeah, I mean, I think I think that and this is evolving, but I think the strategies to deal with hallucinations are are there a few within within any prompt dealing with like source material. So, so first of all, like maybe the obvious one is, you know, nothing that we do for legal professionals ever is just from like the AI's like memory of the world. You know, the, the analogy that you probably heard before, but but to me bears repeating is it's like a student taking a closed book exam, and yeah, GPT four is like a really smart student so it's read a lot it's memorized a lot like it's gonna and by the way the closed book exam with like partial credit for every answer so it's gonna answer you know um but if you don't give it that context um it's a closed book exam and an open book exam it's gonna like give a partial credit answer as best as it possibly can that's where it's especially gonna make up stuff so step one is add in information say read this first and base your answer on this and no extraneous information and and only based on this information you know, provide your answer. Now it's an open book exam to some degree anyways. It's like, it's, it has some source material to refer to. And it's a very smart student. It's a very good reader, very good understander, even though difficult concepts and, and language. And so it's much more likely to get the right answer there. And that, that will eliminate a lot of problems that people have with hallucinations. When you're just, for example, chatting with ChatGPT and like made up who the third president of some country was or whatever. It's like, you know, or what color his hair was or what have you. Like that's not going to happen if, if it has a Wikipedia page about the presence of that country fully in context is, is reading it. Second thing is like, sometimes give it less, less is more. Um, and this is, this is evolving. Like Gemini 1.5 is a million context window is like, I wouldn't necessarily use all a million and expect perfect results, but it can handle a lot of information and still get the answer pretty right. So this is evolving, but the very early days of GPT-4, providing a smaller amount of information, as small as you can, can without corrupting the actual meaning, um, much more likely for it to get the right answer based on that. Um, the prompting itself matters greatly. How, how exactly are you instructing it to, to hang on to the context and not come up with stuff from extraneous information? Um, and then there are a lot of checks. And also, by the way, making cited sources, maybe put a number against every line in the document and be like, which line specifically are you getting this from? You know, it may still hallucinate, but maybe a little less so. Um, and then, then guardrail checks. Like, you know, if you ask it to quote from a document, you can do a non AI kind of just like, is this quote exists in the document kind of check or even a fuzzy check. And if it doesn't, then you have to maybe have a, a, a set of processes 
to a cleanup process. Um, so, so a lot of kind of approaches here, we, we feel really happy about where we got co-counsel to, um, and it's still like a really difficult challenge, right? And, and to test against also, and that's where the human testers also sometimes come in. Even the automated tests can sometimes be like, if it's according to a, not this paragraph, but some other paragraph, it's hallucinating. So we automatically flag it was wrong. But sometimes the human, human graders to go in, it's very subtle sometimes. It's like, adds in the word not, that changes the entire meaning, you know? Um, and sometimes it's smack in your face, obviously, it's citing a case that never existed. Um, you know, and, and, and sometimes you need people to grade that right now, I'd say to, to really get the, the full answer. So it's not, it's not easy, but again, it's doable. Um, and, and doable to a degree that's like, you can, you can stamp out, you know, for your customer's experience, like the vast majority of hallucinations. Well, look, I really appreciate all the practical detail and I'm, I'm like loving this. I also want to use some of our time to ask you some questions, some broader questions about, um, you know, LLMs and legal issues, if that's all right, since you're kind of right yeah, at totally. the intersection yeah. of it. I mean, totally. I guess the you know, one place I would love to start is, you know, um, you know, because you're obviously a fan of, um, of GPT and, um, you know, a lawyer, I'm, I'm curious what you make of the kind of, um, you know, the fair use issues around, um, LLM training. Is that, is that something you think about? So I have to preface this with that. I have not practiced law in a decade and, um, maybe more than a decade at this point, I was not a copyright lawyer. So everything I'm about to say also doesn't represent, I'd say the viewpoints of my company that I work for right now. Like, I'm, but so I doesn't necessarily disagree, but like, uh, I think it's a really tricky issue. Like it's a super tricky issue because on the one hand, you have all this copyrighted material that's used to train it. And there's some things that are like pretty obvious to copyright violations. For example, when uh, an AI produces verbatim, you know, an image or a uh, text from, from something else, if I did that as a person, like if I like verbatim copied out like the text and like passed it off as my own, that would also be a copyright violation. It's like literally, you know, it's almost in the name. It's like, I can't copy, you know, the right is to prevent people from copying. Right. And then there's a lot of like really gray area stuff. Like the fair use questions have been super interesting uh, because again, if, as a human, if I sat down and read all these books and then made me smarter and then I answer questions based on that, I'm not violating any law. Right. And so the question becomes like at massive scale, um, you know, and for, for computer processes, if it's any, if that, if that should be treated any different than like a person sitting there reading this information. The whole point of fair use is like, you know, again, kind of like the name implies, uh, you should have some capacity to, um, even as just people, sometimes as businesses, to read things, get influenced by them, transform them into your own words, your own thoughts, you know, use the kind of facts that are out there in the world to you know inform your opinion and and enable you to say write another book that is also say let's say I read all the Winston Churchill biographies and then wrote my own Winston Churchill biography and like cited to them and didn't copy any of the sentences or any of the expression any of the ways that they they wrote it um, you know but but it came with my own novel kind of interpretation of his legacy like that that's protected and the question is like when GPT four does the same thing about Winston Churchill you know. Um, whether it's kind of doing the same thing. And I guess, I think also gets kind of thorny, like, you know, when, um, it's a very different scenario when I'm just talking to chat GPT, at least I feel it's a bit different scenario. I'm just talking to chat GPT and it's using everything it's read from all these books and articles and so on. And sometimes kind of parroting back what it's heard versus when I'm asked to do like a novel task, like read this document from an internal company document management system that's never been seen before by anybody, you know, and answer questions about this. It's clearly not engaging in, in, in a, activity there, that activity is probably not copyright protection. The question is whether it's training was. Anyway, it's, 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 it's maybe the best thing I can say, and this is a very lawyer kind of answer, it's, it's thorny. It's, it kind of depends on some of the circumstances. Um, and uh, and I think it's it's a tough question for the courts to figure out. You know, I think it's especially tough, frankly. We have these really bad facts where some companies kind of like took stuff, like stole stuff, basically, like scraped illicitly or, you know, and that's part of the training set. I don't know if that changes the legality one way or the other about this course we'll look at it, but they're really bad facts for for the side of fair use and the side of, you know, that, that side of things. It's like, oh, well, you know, you kind of like like stole a bunch of stuff basically and then are, are trained a model on it and they're passing it off for free to a bunch of customers. Like that doesn't feel right. So I, I another guess area, maybe... by the way, too, is like, yeah. Okay. yeah, please go ahead. Oh, I was just, 
I was just thinking that there are kind of policy implications, like if summarization gets way easier, right? Like, you know, if, if most of the way I consume the internet is now from, you know, a summarization company versus going to individual websites, it's really easy to imagine that changing the incentives to, to make any original content. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think it's, I think it's absolutely correct. But that the caveat being like, um, you know, it depends if like the next activity after you read the summary is to read the, the kind of source where it came from and citing its sources. And you're like, okay, I need a deeper dive in this um, or not. And also kind of maybe it depends on the, the monetization model, like we're, we're the way we all monetize today in for most of our content is ads. So yeah, you need to click on the website for this to be worthwhile. I can imagine an alternative world where like, if I'm a great content creator, then I explicitly say to the Googles and open eyes and center of the world, like you're not allowed to use this as part of your training. It's not like a copyright issue. It's like a terms of service issue or whatever. And if you want this, you got to pay me for it. And you do want this because it's high quality information that make your model smarter. And that might be the new, you know, the new business model. Instead of, you know, getting your ads through Google, you're getting your monthly kind of royalty check or what have you. So I do think it, 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 it you know, can potentially influence the business model of, of how content's created. Um, but, but I agree that under the current business model of advertising, it's, it's going to put a lot of pressure on people who, you know, um, created content and made a living off of that. And, and by the way, that, that cuts both ways. Google recently, you know, last four or five years, you Google search for like, uh, for, for many topics. And the thing that comes to the top is stuff that's like geared towards number one on SEO, right? Like the classic examples, you search for a recipe. And the ones that for whatever reason Google's ranking highest includes a person's like friggin' life story before they get to like how to make, you know, grilled cheese. Um, it's like how grandma used to make grilled cheese, now pour it into their family, that they make the same. It's like, I don't care about any of that stuff. But Google upranked that over shorter, more to the point kind of recipe books. Um, so people started doing it. And it made it kind of like a terrible place to be because everybody's optimizing not for like content information intelligence, but instead for you know, what gets ranked higher in SEO. And and you can imagine a world, a different world where, you know, this stuff actually aligns incentives again and the, you know, somehow a determination is made that this content is good content. It'll make my model smarter. It's not just like fluff to get to the top of, of Google for advertising revenue and, and great content creators. Um, and even the content creators who are right now kind of forced into making this stuff for SEO purposes start making much better content. Um, you know, I guess there's a possibility that it goes that way as well. So, um, so I think there, there, there could be a positive dynamic that comes, that comes out of that. That makes sense. Um, well, look, I, I'd love to, I'd love to end with a question from our head of legal, um, uh, that heard that I was interviewing you and she, she asked something I think really interesting, which is, um, you know, how do you see what your work and others work around AI is influencing the education of future lawyers. Like, how, how do you expect the profession to change? And would you have any advice for someone in law school right now on, on what they should be learning? Yeah, it's interesting because I think um, what's going to happen, and whether we do it or other companies do it, or the industry move, or, 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 honestly, even opening eyes models to get better and handle some of this be, like, themselves, is a lot of the tasks that lawyers used to do as young attorneys. Um, are no longer done by young attorneys. They're they're more, more and more done by AI. And we're talking about tasks that are like there's a million documents to review in this case. Each of you get a hundred thousand. You have like seven weeks to click through every single document and tell me if any of them seem relevant to the case. Or um, you know, basic document creation or comparing documents or taking that that older version of the contract and then kind of brushing it up to make it make sense of the new term sheet. Um, that we just got, you know, for, for this matter, I think those are the kinds of things that AI will, will, you know, be increasingly capable of handling, um, better and better and better until the point that then young associates don't do that anymore. And I think for a lot of people, that's really scary because, um, that's how they were trained when they entered practice is like they, they first did the grunt work, so to speak. What, um, one of the managing partners, one of the largest firms in the country I met with him was like, what will we do if these guys don't have to dig ditches anymore? Dig ditching is the uh, 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 ditch digging was the word he used. Right? What do you do if um, uh, if that's if that's the case? And uh, I guess here's here's my feeling about it. My feeling is um, right now today, 
Uh, we currently do things with technology that like 20 years ago and 40 years ago and 50 years ago would be like unthinkable. Like literally lawyers used to use typewriters and go to the library to research by opening up books and not using, there's no control F or no search function of the book. You just flip through the book and then maybe a reference to another book, which you go pull from the library and read that other book. We are way more efficient and do things that we never did before. Um, thanks to simple changes like, like word processing, email, the internet, you know, uh, and, and that, that didn't like destroy jobs or make it like harder to train attorneys, like be able to start doing more valuable stuff with their time and from day one. And, and right now today, if you ask a lot of young attorneys, um, how it's like at working a law firm, I think a lot of them will say like, I am not doing the work I went to law school to do. In fact, I can't believe that someone with this much debt is being paid this much money is doing this task. Why can't it be done by somebody else already today? So I think that like. AI is going to put pressure on those kinds of jobs um, and those kind of tasks, I should say, not jobs, but tasks, and and continue to uplevel people as they have been with the advent of like the internet and word processing and so on, right? I think it's going to continue that kind of directional trend. And the truth is that, that law school as an education is a really good preparation for the world, for, for law students entering the, the profession um, in a world after AI has automated a lot of the BS. You don't actually learn any of the BS in law school. That's just the great trick of law school is you spend all of your time in law school reading cases, reading contracts, and having these like kind of amazing debates about strategy and policy. And then you show up to the law firm, like, read these million documents, get this whole read these million documents, you know, and like don't come out until, until you've read a million documents, all the emails being exchanged from this company you've never heard of about the most boring topic you possibly imagine. Right? You're like that's why you have a lot of turnover in this profession. Um, and so I think I think that that um, law students probably don't need to change much. But what they're doing in the classic legal education, I do think that they have to probably start experimenting with AI. And, and, and because I think maybe to depend on this kind of thought, I think this is true, not just in law, but everywhere. As soon as you have these AI assistants that are super capable, um, the activity, the, the kind of the, I'd say that what makes lawyers great today pre AI is like grind. Like, am I able to grind through more time, more documents, more whatever? That's how you like prove your value almost as a, as a lawyer. And I think that that delegation will become the most important skill set, right? Um, I now have this AI who will grind for me. Um, am I expressing what I need to do clearly enough that my little employee, my little AI employee will do it well? Am I giving a feedback about the work that it's doing? Am I delegating the right things and holding the, right, the other the other things for myself, right? Um, the can of management as a, as a kind of art and science, I think it's going to start to be applied to younger and younger employees across all businesses. Um, and like other great managers, if you can figure out how to get leverage by delegating more and more to your to your subordinates, in this case, your subordinate AI, um, that's going to really go far for you. And so I think that's that's going to be one of the main skills that will distinguish, um, as, as I say, the 2010s and before, 2020s and before, lawyers from distinguish themselves by building more hours, working harder, and just like, you know, still reading documents accurately at 4 a.m. as they're clipping through the next million million documents. That will become less important and will become more important is people who are able to deploy um, the, the tools they have accessible to them and delegate effectively. And I think it's actually a bright future. I think it's much more fun, interesting, challenging, intellectually, you know, intellectually challenging. Um, and I think people will will ultimately like that. It'll be a, it will be a difference. And I think that that's maybe the one thing in law school that you only really get experience through trying it, you know, and, and get like knowledge around trying it. So I, I encourage people to start just pick up ChatGPT today and, and see what it's like having this AI assistant. And, and can you leverage yourself? How little work can you do now that you have this AI assistant? And what are the things you have to, have to hold on to yourself? Where is your delegate and capable? Where are you capable? I think those are the kinds of, uh, I think, interesting questions for, for law students in the future. All right, Jake, thanks so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. It's fun talking. Thanks so much for listening to this episode of Gradient Descent. Please stay tuned for future episodes.